the book of the beginnings is where we'll begin today. If you find your copies of scripture and turn to Genesis chapter 12 is where we'll start. If you are here today and uh, you made it here without your copy of scripture, we'll remind you we have copies here for you. So I want to provide those for everybody to be able to see a copy of this today. We're going to move around a little bit. So if you're here today, uh, wait, you got some back there in the back, Chris. Seems like you got some right over here. Raise your hand if you need some. See like right here. There's one. Raise your hand. We'll bring it to you. If you're unfamiliar with, with, with Scripture, we'll tell you what page it's on. You'll borrow ours. We'll make sure you know what, what you can see. Anybody over here need one? Good? Right over there. Just change over here. Just change over here. Just change over here. <laughs> Genesis chapter 12 you've been standing for a while normally I would ask you to stand and, and honor this but I'm just going to read three short verses of scripture and we're going to go straight into this so go by Genesis chapter 12 we're talking today and continuing our series on true or false true or false we've been examining all the religions of the world and, and some of the mainstream uh, religions that we have uh, here that we've seen that we've witnessed that we've been a part of and uh, we've been examining what's true and what's false, what's right and what's wrong. What does the Bible say? What do they say? What do they believe as compared to Scripture? We've examined Catholicism. We've examined Jehovah's Witness. Last week we examined Judaism. And today we come to Islam. Is it true or false? It's easy for us to watch the news and easily look at it and say, that's so wrong. How can people believe in that? They're so wicked. They're so... And you just fill in the blank. But do you know that? Do you know them? Do you know what they really believe? Do you know why they believe what they believe? Is it true or is it false? We're going to discover that today, okay? In just a few short verses of Scripture, we're going to do a lightning fast history of this, even though it's centuries and thousands of years old. Uh, we're going to get to the very beginning of it today. In an effort to define it, though, before we get to the Scripture, if you've got your sermon notes handy and a writing utensil, here's your first fill in the blank today. Islam itself, the word means... Submission. Islam means submission. And the root word is from the original Arabic meaning peace. Now, we can turn on the news today and go, uh, that seems to kind of uh, contradict everything that we see from the radical extremists, right? There doesn't seem to be a lot of submission. There doesn't seem to be a lot of peace on the earth because of the Middle East and, and all that's going on. But I, I also discovered this week that they're not all just crammed in the Middle East. Islam is all over the world. It has been a great mission effort to convert the world since Genesis chapter 16 that we'll come to in just a minute. A Muslim then is one who would submit himself to Allah, meaning the God, the one true God. There are over a billion Muslims on the planet today, seven million plus in the United States alone. But I was, it was interesting for me to notice this week as we begin to, to see the breakdown of this because I wanted to see where they're from and how much of the world they had uh, converted. And I was stunned to see that the majority of Muslims are outside of the Middle East. 61% of the Muslim population in the world is in Asia, outside of the Middle East. Only 19% of the Muslim community is in the Middle East and Northern Africa. When we say Asia, we're talking about the most uh, per capita, the most Muslim concentrated place in the world is in Indonesia. 99% complete Muslim. 16% are in the southern part of Africa, 3% in Europe, and 1% in North and South America. So, yes, they're all over. Yes, it's been quite an effort. Yes, it's been quite a, a missionary endeavor for the Islam community to take Allah and his message and convert people around the world. We said to you at the beginning of the series that there was over a thousand or a, a billion Catholics on the planet. So between what we examine there and what they're teaching is false, and there's a billion of them, and there's a billion Muslims who believe what they're teaching is false, there's five billion on the planet. Let's take a billion children out there who can't think and haven't understood for themselves yet. And before you know it, half of the world, half of the world's adult thinking, rationalizing population, reasoning human beings are false. Just with those two religions. Where does it come from? This is where we get today. Let's go quickly because I need to to continue with me here super fast. Genesis chapter 12 is where we'll begin. And the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country.
country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Now, just right here at the beginning of this, I said lightning fast history, and I just think of things that, that come to me. We should go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house. It's interesting for you to know today that Abraham was not born in Jerusalem. There was no such thing as Jerusalem when Abraham was living and when he was born. Abraham was born in the Middle East. He was born in the Persian Empire. He was born in, the, in what we would consider today in the Iraq, Iran area. That, that's where he was born. That's where, he's, where he grew up. That's where his family was. When God called him, he said, go to the land I'm going to show you. He said, but you have to go away from your country, away from your relatives, away from your father's house to a land which I will show you. Then nowhere, just take off, I'll get you there. He says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, Abraham, and all your family. And the one who curses you, Abraham, I will curse. So keep that in mind as we go through the history, as we go through the scriptures today. The one who curses Abraham, the one who curses God's people, what will he do to them? Curse them. Keep that in mind. And then you, all the families of the earth, will be blessed. Abraham was 75 years old when God came to him. He pretty much lived his life, right? God wasn't finished with him, yet it was just the beginning when God called Abraham and made a covenant with him. All right, skip over to Genesis chapter 15. After a, a faithful but rather shaky, rocky start, God saw it necessary to restate the covenant with Abram. And so in, in chapter 15, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me, since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house shall be my heir. God thought differently, though. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. Look at verse 5. Now look toward the heavens and count the stars. If you are able to count them, so shall your descendants be. And Abram believed in the Lord, and God credited him or reckoned it to him as righteousness. There's a pretty good covenant going on here. There's a great relationship going on between Abraham and his God. And God between his chosen man here. He's going to establish a work. He's going to establish something new. He started a covenant with Abraham. And what God starts, God will make sure he finishes in spite of his other children, covenant keepers. Right? Check out Genesis chapter 16. In Genesis 16, now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. All right, as we begin this chapter, we see that there's still uh, an effort of saying, God, you haven't given me any kids. You promised me something, but you haven't shown me anything yet. What are you going to do about that? And so look on in the scripture here. Sarah said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And if you'd like to write in your Bible, I want you to write or underline this next sentence. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Abraham was all alone, minding his own business with his family in, a, in the Middle East, in the middle of the desert, a Bedouin tribe, Bedouin community. And God said, hey, Abram, I've got something in mind. I'm going to take you to a place. I'm going to show you, and I'm going to give you something that I don't want you to take, but in you I want to establish my people. <clears throat> and Abraham listened to the voice of God, and he followed, and he obeyed, and he prospered everywhere he went. And God credited to him, he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And if you look back in the book of James, it said that God said that you are a friend of God. Pretty great start, but, but what verse did you just underline in the Bible? Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. Let me just stop right here and say that at any given time that you listen to another voice that does not belong to God, you are opening yourself up for a world of hurt. Amen. I don't care how pretty she is. I don't care how good she smells. I don't care how much the promise is and how much money you're going to make as you enter a relationship with her. 
It does not matter. You listen to another voice beside the voice of your God, and trouble is coming. Little did Abraham know what he was about to thrust over the world. So he goes in, he takes Hagar as his wife, he, he uh, has relations with her, and she becomes pregnant. And when she becomes pregnant, Sarah gets upset. Hey, look how easy it was for her. She's upset. She gets mad. Abraham takes it into his own hands and leaves it up to his wife. Now instead of taking control of the situation and, and reasoning out and pondering and, and consulting the voice of the Lord, he said, well, just do with her whatever you want. So now she runs away because Sarah treats Hagar harshly because she so easily got pregnant to her husband. So Hagar flees and, and God says in verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority because I'm going to make a great nation out of the one that is in your womb right now. Look at verse 11. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, which means God hears, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and if you're following along in King James today, it's why we don't ask you to read out loud today. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live where? He will live to the east of his brothers. He will live in hostility. He will live in defiance to his brothers. Ishmael is born in chapter 17. It says Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him in 1660. So in, verse, in chapter 16, verse 16, Abram was 86 years old. God called him when he was 75. He promised him a son. 11 years later, he's 86 years old. It still hasn't happened. Abraham takes matters into his own hands. He makes sure that everything happens the way it needs to happen. And boom, here comes Ishmael. He's 86 years old now, and Ishmael is born. Finally, the child of promise. But God says, how much longer? 99 years old. It's 13 years. God's voice has been silent to Abram. Ishmael would be 13 years old. He's grown. The child promises the heir of the kingdoms of God said, I am God Almighty in chapter 17. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my kingdom. I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him. For 13 years, God's voice has been silent to Abram. Oh yeah. <laughs> they didn't have that kind of music back then. <laughs> don't you just love them the quiet times when you don't know In a minute, I'll be ranting and raving and sweating and spinning and things like that. Your phone won't go off then, it's when I call myself. <laughs> there is now, therefore, no condemnation, though, for those of you that are in Christ Jesus and whose cell phones go off in the middle of the church. It's okay. All right? So, Isaac, I mean, Ishmael is born and everything looks like it's going to be all right, but it's not. It's not all right. There's more trouble. There's more struggle. But go to chapter 21, if you would. Finally, finally, the Lord took note of Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah, as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time. I don't know what your translation says there. Mine says at the appointed time. Time. God called him when he was 75. Abraham took matters in his own hands in 86. Now he's 100 years old. Now is the appointed time. That doesn't work too well for us, does it? God calls us, we want to do it right now. God calls us, we hear something from the Lord, we read something in Scripture, and it's got to happen just right now. We get saved and we immediately want to be glorified, don't we? We get saved and we want all of our troubles to go away because now God is on our side. We get saved and we expect things to happen that are just naturally supposed to be good, good things. And we're supposed to live in peace and harmony and everything is supposed to go really well. And Uncle Sam won't bother us and nobody else will bother us. We're just going to get to do what we want to do. It's been 25 years. Now is the appointed time of which God has spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Isaac. Isaac was the child of promise. It was through Isaac that God had plans to 
build his nation because out of Isaac would come Jacob and Esau and out of Jacob would come the 12 tribes of Israel and out of the 12 tribes of Israel come God's nation. See how this works? But what happened was Abraham got a little jump start on the plan. Why? He listened to the voice of his wife more than he listened to the voice of his God. Again, she may be great. But she is not the voice of your God. Listen to him first. Skip over to chapter 25. Sarah has died. Ishmael is older. It's been a, Abraham is 100 years old when he has Isaac. Let's just skip around in here. Look at it. And Abraham is about to die. It says in verse 7, These are all the years of Abraham's life. Abraham's life that he lived 175 years. 175 years now. In between Isaac being born when he was 100 and his death at 175, there's 75 years of dwelling together and living together. But somewhere in the meantime, Isaac is being mocked by Ishmael. Ishmael understands and realizes that his favorite son, Isaac, is getting more privileged. He's going to be the heir to kingdom. And so Ishmael, as the older brother, begins to mock the younger. And Sarah is not going to have any piece of that. So she banishes Hagar. She banishes Ishmael. And they go and they dwell in the east. And they run and they live in the desert. And they establish a community of themselves. As God has promised, as God included Ishmael in the Abrahamic covenant, he says Isaac is the one who is the promised one. In chapter 25, Abraham dies. And check out, uh, Abraham in verse 8 breathes his last. In verse 9, his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. This is a place where he had purchased, he had buried Sarah, and now Abraham's being buried, and Isaac and Ishmael have been reunited to bury their father. In verse 12, it says, These are the records of the generations of Ishmael. In verse 16, these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps. Twelve princes, according to their tribes. Interesting, Ishmael has twelve princes, and out of Isaac and Jacob comes twelve princes, twelve tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. And they, his people, settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as one goes toward Assyria. And then look at the last phrase. He settled in defiance or in hostilities of all his relatives. I want to show you a picture. Of, I think I've got this up here today. And I went off and forgot my stick again, so I'll have to move to this. All right, this is my pointer. All right, so here we are. Abraham was born over here. And God led him up into here and down and began to settle. There was no such thing as Jerusalem and Damascus back then. He settled in what we know in the New Testament as Samaria. Remember the Jews hated the Samaritans? Remember all that story? Well, long before then, this is where Abraham settles. So all of his family is here now. And he grows and he prospers and he, he grows extremely wealthy. He's got all of this stuff. And Israel is formed. But when Hagar and Ishmael are banished, they run to the desert. And they hide and they build a community in the desert. What we know as the Arabian Desert then, what we see as the Sinai Peninsula, this is where Egypt is, where the children crossed the Red Sea and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. This is what we're talking about. This whole area. What we see over here in Babylon and Ur and Nineveh. So all this area was the Persian Empire early on. Okay? All down through here. This was... A great nation, the 12 princes, the 12 sons of Ishmael, and they began to scatter, and they began to, to build a huge, enormous kingdom. Put that elephant up there today. Let me show you what it is today. Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all this hatred, all this stuff. What? And look at that. One little sliver of Jerusalem. One little sliver of Israel. What in the world keeps all this from just pushing them into the Mediterranean. Oh, God. <coughs> mm. Think God's promise is just flippant 
where he just says something and then accidentally things are going to happen or coincidentally things may happen. You think it's coincidence that all of that might and all of that power and all of that oil and all of that money and all of that there, the, the fierceness of the tribes and the fierceness of the peoples that they have and their hatred toward Israel, what in the world keeps them from just taking over? Because really Israel is split in half, isn't it? Between the Palestinians and the Arabs and the Israelis today? It's a massive, massive history. Where did it come from? Abraham listened to the voice of his wife instead of the voice of his God. Now let's fast forward for the sake of time. Let's fast forward several thousand years. Jesus has been born of a baby. He's been crucified on the cross. He's risen and resurrected and ascended to the Father. The Pentecost has come. The Holy Spirit has come. The, the early church is established and scattered through persecution. The, the, the Roman Empire falls and things continue to move and to grow around the world. And in 570 A.D., a man named Muhammad, a thoughtful businessman, is, is born in Mecca. He was born in Saudi Arabia. He was an orphan. He was raised by his uncle. He was a merchant. And for 40 years of his life, he was a very thoughtful, very religious, very uh, eager-minded man. But in 610 AD, Muhammad wanders off in the wilderness to pray and to contemplate. He gets into a cave and he has a vision. And the angel Gabriel appears to him in a vision and gives him instructions for life and godliness and how to live. And over the course of the next 20 years, he keeps going back to the cave and going back to the mountains. And Gabriel continues to appear to him. And most scholars, that, as they look back over history, I learned this week, they don't even think Muhammad could read or write. That's why they call this so holy, because Muhammad was given to him. And then he would tell somebody what Gabriel said and describe. He would describe it down and write it down. And thus, the Quran was organized and the religion of Islam was born. It was not... A religion born out of peace and eagerness. The religion and Muhammad sought to convert all that were in that community and in that area. And he began to go around what we know as Saudi Arabia and in the Arabian Desert and the Arabian Peninsula and began to use bribery and terrorism and conquest to convert all to Islam. In 632, Muhammad dies and thus begins a reign of distrust and dispute as to who the rightful heir of Muhammad would be and how Islam will continue. And still to this day, this was 632 AD. We are now 2,000 years later almost. And the two factions and the two uh, entities that are continuing the war today are warring still over the same thing. Who is the rightful heir? Who carries the promise and the power of Allah to the people? You may know them today as Sunnis and Shiites. If you watch the news, if you read the paper, you will know that this is still in great conflict today. Throughout the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the Crusades, the, the conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants and the Protestants and the, and the, and the Muslims and the power over whose land is whose and, and, and who has the rights to Jerusalem, the holiest of holy lands, and on and on and on it goes. Great power and great authority has been given to one side while the other fights and wars against it. Skipping forward all the way into the 20th century, in 1948 after World War II, due to the atrocities of, of the Holocaust in, in Europe, the United Nations gave a portion of the land of Israel back to the Jewish people. And I'm not exactly all the details on it. Some of you were alive back then, but you were small. You won't remember all the details. But Great Britain had some control over all of that. And the United Nations gave a portion back to the Jews. I say back to the Jews because it's important. It's always been their land as God gave that to them. However, thousands and thousands of Arabs and Palestinians were living in the land. And when they gave it back to the Jews, they, the United Nations made sure that there was free rule and reign for the Jewish people to come home. But the land is not big enough for them. And thousands of Arabs and Palestinians were displaced in 1948 and 49 and 50. And for three years, there was great intense conflict going on. And when the Arabs protested, they were rejected. When they fought back, they were soundly defeated. And when they sought refuge in their neighboring Arab countries, they were refused. And I would ask you today, if somebody came into your house 
and stormed into your house, took you out, and banished you from your home and your family, kicked them completely out of Sumner County, and said, you are not welcome here. And you stood in protest, and you were rejected, and you tried to fight back, and you were defeated, and you sought refuge from your neighbors, and they refused you. I'm sure there would be some intensity of feelings that you would have for that, right? And hence we have today some of the great political and radical extremist groups we know as uh, Hamas, Taliban, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, today ISIS, continuing the obsession with wiping out Israel, wiping out the infidel, all non-Muslims, the bitterness, the hatred, the war, and the dead. <laughs> Why? In Genesis chapter 16, Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Instead of the voice of his God. And when he went into Hagar, and she conceived, I wonder if this is what Abraham had in mind when he so desperately sought an heir for his kingdom. So let me just go quickly through this today. There, to be a good Muslim, you have to believe in certain things, you have to do certain things. Right? I don't have the time to, to get into a lot of details. So I'm going to go through these quickly. You got some fill in the blanks in your notes. Be a good Muslim, you've got six core beliefs. Six core beliefs. The first is this there is one true God, and his name is Allah. His name is not Jehovah, his name is not Elohim, his name is Allah. This means the God, and they worship him as the God. And, I, and I've got a, a little commentary from their website, IslamReligion.com, that says this Many people have come to believe that Muslims worship a different God than Christians and Jews. However, this is totally false. Since Allah is simply the Arabic word for God, and there is only one God, let there be no doubt, Muslims worship the same God of Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus. Peace be on them all. You heard that before? You don't see a lot of that today, do you? Peace be on them all, because we all worship the same God. However, it is certainly true that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all have different concepts of Almighty God. Here's the problem. For example, Muslims like Jews reject the Christian beliefs of the Trinity and the divine incarnation. Islam teaches that other religions have in one way or another distorted and nullified a pure and proper belief in Almighty God by neglecting Allah's true teachings and mixing them with man-made ideas. They believe in one true God. Anyone who does not worship that God or view of Him, the concept of their God in the way that they do, must be eliminated. They also believe in angels. There are good angels that come and support them and protect them and, and relay uh, Allah's message to them. And each person has two angels. I did not know this, but each person has two angels. Each Muslim has two angels to record our daily actions and report to Allah. They're there to protect and to give us God's message. And number three, a lot of you have heard this. The scriptures are what they believe in. They are strictly adhering to these scriptures. And they believe that the Quran is the holy and inspired and perfect word of God. Quran means reading or reciting. It is God's final revelation to man through God's final prophet in Muhammad. It is the centerpiece and supreme authority over all Islamic thought. Just as we would see today, the, the scriptures, the holy Bible that we have, the Christian Bible that we have, is the exact perfect Word, inspired Word of God. And we would hold up and say, this is right. This is true. They would hold up the Quran and they would say, this is the perfect, inspired, holy Word of God. This is right. This is true. So when our copy of Scripture from God says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, their copy of Scripture says, eradicate the infidel and eliminate all who don't convert to your religion. So which one is right? What is wrong? You can tell there's some problems here. However, there are no authoritative translations that the normal man can have. They, they learn from Rome. They learn a lot from, their, from, the, uh, from the imams or the, the priests that they have uh, for themselves. There are no authoritative translations outside the original Arabic language. And that's why you won't see a Muslim today with his Quran open, with his Quranic uh, concordance, his Quranic Bible dictionary or commentaries or anything like that. You won't see them studying that. Most of them can't even read that original dialect, that original language. They have to come and, and learn it and then they can memorize and recite certain words. But they don't know the scriptures. They don't know their own scriptures. And that is a huge problem. A huge problem. They have some tolerance for the 
Christian Bible. They believe in the Old Testament. They believe in the Gospels. They believe in the story of Jesus. They just won't hold to His divinity. They believe that our scriptures, especially the New Testament, after the Gospels, have been tainted and corrupted by man. It's an important book. The Quran is the important book. It is the centerpiece for their thought. And I, and I read this this week. It says, it is critical to recognize that the Quran is the source not only for theological beliefs and ritual practice in the Islamic world, but also for such things as Arabic grammar and language, calligraphy, the arts and sciences, law, philosophy, and politics. Everything is based on the Quran. Everything is based on it. It is such an important book for their early, early learning and their development and societal improvement. There is no such thing in the Islamic world as separation of church and state. And so before we go poking the Muslims in the eye today, let's realize for a second, what would be the possibility of America if the New Testament was taught in our elementary schools to teach our kids how to read according to the New Testament? What if law and science and writing and, and, and politics and everything was based out of the New Testament today and out of an understanding of, of the doctrines of Christ? Would we be different? Oh, yeah. I don't think so. <clears throat> but we can't get it out of our schools fast enough. We can't get our holy, inspired, perfect word of God out of our schools and out of our government fast enough. Why? Because we don't want to fail anybody. We don't want to offend our Muslim friends who might think differently. We don't want to offend our other friends because they might think differently. You know what? They think differently anyway, and they're threatening to kill the world for it. Where's our passion? Where's our zeal for the Word? Are we raising our children in the understanding of the Word of God? They know Daniel and the lions. Then they might know Jonah and a big fish. They might know David beat a, a big old Goliath with a rock and a sling. They might know some stories of the Bible. But when it comes to the New Testament and the doctrines of the Word of God is what we're supposed to live by, do we really know that? They do. <coughs> the Muslims do. They read it and they study it. And it is vital to them to learn it. There's two sections of this, two, two additions to the Quran that, that, that really provide some struggle with it. The first of all is Sunnah. Sunnah is the stories about Muhammad's life, his customs, and his practices that, that the Muslims must follow. And then the Hadith. Hadith means traditions. It is the narration of his life. But what's happened, though, is, is as you've got the Quran here, you've got the inspired word of God, you come with the Sunnah, and you come with the Hadith. And before you know it, the customs and the practices of a man have now trumped what God said, what Allah said here. And it waters it down, and it waters it down to the point where they start listening to the commentary. They start following after Muhammad and contradict and, and are inconsistent with the very words that they would say that they hold to. We must believe in Allah. We must follow Him. But, however, in their thinking, whatever comes latest is the most authoritative. And so Allah in the Quran was written in 570 and 600 AD and all, all up through there. But each additional commentary that's been given to that, they give more weight to that than what was originally written down. It would be very much like for us today, of us neglecting the Word of God, putting it on the shelf and turning and watching TV. Listening to someone else talk about it. It would be the same thing as us neglecting the word and putting it aside and just reading some books about it all the time. You might know what that guy says about it, but you don't know what God says about it. Be very careful what you read and what you listen to. According to most pious Muslims today, the, the most pious Muslims, they believe that Muhammad was not perfect, that he was not a God, but he lived a virtually perfect life. We are to adapt the same things that he was, his customs, his habit, his actions, everything. The Hadith is the Quran in action, and that's what they most closely follow. They believe in prophets. Even Jesus was a great prophet. They believe in predestination. Inshallah is what they call it. Inshallah is predestination. If Allah wills, they would say. If Allah wills, it will happen. If Allah does it, it won't happen. And so they live a very free life, knowing that whatever they do, that Allah has will. <laughs> and then number six is judgment. They believe in heaven and hell. They believe that entrance into paradise, into heaven, hinges upon the strict adherence to the Quran, to these beliefs, and to the five pillars of faith that we'll discuss next. So the six core beliefs are what you must believe. These five pillars are what you must do, and they are this. 
there's a confession of faith, a statement of faith that every good Muslim must make to be a Muslim. Shahada is what it is called. There is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. You have to say that, believe it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength before you can become a Muslim. Then you must pray. There are five ritual prayers a day. You've probably seen this before. Where there at sunrise at noon time in the mid afternoon at sunset, and then an hour after sunset, there are five ritual prayers. They're the same prayers, memorized prayers. Sometimes a recitation from the Quran. Uh, they must wash. They must be cleansed, and then they will pray. Three is alms giving. They are they are charitable people. At least once a year they are, and uh, there is a set price that must be paid at two and a half percent. Another reason why we will not convert to that, because we prefer to go 10% from the Old Testament, right? So we'll not be converting to 2.5% today, we'll be demanding the whole 10%. You can give an extra 2.5% if you so choose to, uh, or go wild and, and give 13%, all right? Number four is fasting from sunrise to sunset during Ramadan, which is Muhammad's birth month. Uh, they will fast from in the day, time, hours. Interesting note that I read this week. I knew about the fast, but during the month of Ramadan, it is the highest consumption and, and sale of food in, in the Muslim community. Uh, and I'm thinking, that doesn't make any sense. That, I mean, they're fasting, right? But it is after they have completed the fast, after the sun goes down, it's party time. <laughs> and they feast and they celebrate how Allah had willed for them to be able to do it if they were to be, and they were good Muslims throughout the day, staying faithful to the cause, and they will be rewarded with a great meal and celebration and feast in the evening time. So they gorge themselves with food at night, much like we do on Saturday nights around here. Okay. And then lastly is pilgrimage. Uh, most of you have heard of this, it's called the Hajj. If physically and financially able, uh, all good Muslims are to make at least one trip to Mecca in their lifetime. Now, I look at all this and I go, submission and peace and one true God, adherence to scripture and, and commonality and, 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 and inviting an environment of people to come around and worship God. I'm like, that's all good, right? That sounds so great. It doesn't seem so bad. So why do they want to kill us? Why do they want to kill us? Let me first of all say, not all of them want to. <coughs> and you need to be very careful with this because not all Arabs are Muslims, not all Muslims are Arabs, not all the people of the world who claim uh, Islam and, and pray to Allah are wicked people. you got to understand it because I want you to know not all people in this room today that say they're Christians are Christians. Not all people that will confess and profess the name of the Lord really know who He is. They've heard about Him. They know stories about him. They might even be able to quote a scripture or two to sound pretty good, but they don't know him. And what is going to be the, the judgment call that Christ makes at the end of days when we stand before him? Depart from me, for I never what? I never knew you. I never knew you. You must be in a relationship with him. But let me quickly go through this. Muslims are offended by our secularism. That's why they want to kill. They're offended by our wealth and by how we use it. The Western dominance and the power that, that the United States and Great Britain and, and the Western countries have had, uh, they are offended by that and they hate that, especially in our favoritism toward Israel. They cannot stand the fact that we side with this one little country they believe that are so contrary to them. I read this week that they believe it was Israel that God was to take to, or that Abraham was to take to Mount Moriah. It was Israel that was supposed to be sacrificed to the Lord, not Isaac in the first place. Ishmael was the son of promise and not Isaac. And so that whole thing just keeps going on and on. So when we show favoritism toward Israel, we are thumbing our noses at the Muslim community and they hate us for that. The Quran contains at least 109 verses. 109 verses they call Muslims to war with non-believers for the sake of Islamic rule. Some are quite graphic with commands to chop off heads and fingers and kill infidels wherever they may be hiding. Again, an infidel is a non-believer, a non-Muslim. Muslims who do not join the fight are called hypocrites and warn that Allah will send them to hell if they do not join in the slaughter. While many Muslims are peace-loving, others interpret the Quran as giving them divine permission to convert or kill non-Muslims. In the Quran, chapter 4, verse 76, it says, those who believe fight in the cause of Allah. In the Quran, 25, verse 52, says, therefore, listen not to the unbelievers, but strive against them with the utmost strenuousness. In Quran 61, 4, it says, surely Allah loves those who fight 
in his way. When we talk about fighting in his way, you've heard this word before, jihad. Jihad comes as a form of what we call Sharia law. Sharia law it means divine law, holy commands from Allah. Jihad comes from that. Jihad means struggle. It is a holy war against the infidels of the world. Many Muslims believe that the killing of an infidel, the killing of even an in innocence, the killing of a non-believer, of a non-Muslim, will guarantee them paradise. There is apostasy, conversion, and criticism. In apostasy, it's those who claim to be Muslims but who fall or drift away. They get the death penalty. Conversion to other religions is considered blasphemy, and they get the death penalty. The criticism, the very criticism of Islam, Muhammad, or the Quran, gets the death penalty. And ladies and gentlemen, in our comfortable American church today, let me just tell you this. I think we're safe for a season. But pretty soon, this type of message will be very dangerous. The main reason... And the reason why we've examined all of these others, when you put up the, the measuring stick for all of these religions, true or false, right or wrong, it comes to this inevitable question. What do you do with Jesus? Who is Jesus? The main reason that they hate us, the main reason that they hate anyone who are not, they don't understand Jesus. They call him Isa. <laughs> Jesus is Isa. He was a great man and an important prophet. And a true servant of Allah. He's mentioned 25 times in the Quran. They believe in Jesus. They believe in the biblical account of the virgin birth. They hold that. But they also believe, while well, they believe in the virgin birth, they all believe that he was created like Adam. And they wholeheartedly reject the divinity of Christ. And to ascribe divinity to Jesus is a major unforgivable sin. Because in the Quran it says Allah is one. He has no partner and begot no one. Allah is one, has no partner, and begot no one. They reject his sacrificial atonement because they believe it was just completely unnecessary. There's no such thing as original sin. There's no such thing as a curse of the world and curse of sin because of Adam and Eve. They also believe in the Quran, uh, chapter 4, that Jesus did not die on the cross. Allah took him, he was persecuted, but Allah took him to heaven before he died. And when Jesus returns, he will be a follower of Muhammad and will kill the Antichrist. Anyone not accepting Islam will be slain. After ruling on the earth for 40 years, Jesus will die. Now while they claim to be people of the book, they understand the Bible, they understand the Torah, they understand the Quran, they, they read these things, they understand these things, their practice completely betrays them, doesn't it? When we think of submission and peace, we certainly don't see that kind of submission and peace on the news today. But I dare say, uh, you turn on the news and, and see what kind of Christian is responding to some kind of thing that they don't agree with. I don't see a lot of Christianity in them. We claim to be people of the book, but when our actions betray us, beware. You cannot pick and choose which law suits you the best and then run without it. Reject all others that offend you. We can't do that with our company of scripture. They can't do it to theirs. What makes Islam a false religion is this. They have a complete misunderstanding of who God is. A complete misunderstanding of who God is. There's a rejection of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of the world. Despite the, the warnings and the, and the instruction of scripture, they complete, they'll listen to the Gospels. They'll get into a little bit of Acts, but they would reject the Holy Spirit. They would reject anything else being God, and they reject Him. In fact, they blaspheme the Holy Spirit, which we learned back in the summer was the unforgivable sin. Because in blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you were rejecting Christ, the very one whom the Spirit testifies and glorifies. Now, I asked myself this question this week. Who is Muhammad? And while I was trying to answer that, and who is Jesus as they compare? Who is Muhammad and who is Jesus? Who is Muhammad and who is Jesus? And, I, I, and the more I began to ask myself the question out loud, the very essence of the question tells it all, doesn't it? Who was Muhammad and who is Jesus? Do you hear that, church? Who was Muhammad? Who is Jesus? One king, yes. He was a man, yes. He did good things, yes. He conquered for Allah and followed Allah, his God, and he did wonderful things. But he died. And he is still dead. One has come from God, the one true God. 
He preached. He did some wonderful things. He died for you. And he lives again. I'm going to ask you to turn to the back of your Bibles today. We'll, we'll begin to conclude with the scripture. First John is where we're going, not the Gospel of John, but First John in the back. We can help with that. It's on page 1220. If you're borrowing one of our copies of Scripture, if you have one of our Spanish Bibles, it's page 1600. If you go to Revelation, hang a left, go backwards a little bit. Uh, Revelation is the last book, and you can go backwards just a few, just a few pages, and you'll get to First John. <coughs> How do we test it? How do we know what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false? How do we know what to listen to? Where do we know what to go? What's the measuring stick? How, do, how can we tell? Because, man, everything seems so good. It seems so right. And John says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. John said, test the spirits. Test the voices. Test what you're hearing what you're listening to. He says, by this, verse 2, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. There's your first measure of the spirit. Verse 3, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. And he who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How do we know right from wrong? For those who are confessing Christ, who are preaching Christ, he is the one who's bringing truth. For the one that is bringing anything opposite of that, he's the one that's bringing error and falsehood and lies. The Bible identifies him as antichrist. Not necessarily a capital A, the Antichrist, but all those who are against Jesus are anti-Christ. Turn over a page to 1 John 2. Chapter 2, verse 22. And John asks this question. Who is this liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He calls him a liar. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, the devil is the father of lies. John heard that. He recorded it. He picked up a nice one of his letters to his church. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, here it is, does not have the Father. Whoever does not have the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father. Jesus, or John wants us to be very, very clear here. There are Antichrists who do not confess Him, who reject His divinity, who reject anything apart of Him being God, who put Him on the same measure as man. He says, you'll know the spirit of error, that that is false, because that is not John. He also says, for those that know Him, you'll be known by Him. Jesus said in Matthew 7 that you'll be known by your fruit. You'll be known by your fruit. There will be evidence in you. What is that evidence going to be? It's going to be the confession of Christ, the following after Him. Now, I say these things to you, and I believe the whole series may be birthed out of this understanding that I had a few weeks ago as I watched the Catholic Pope parade through Central Park. And to begin the question, what makes this good man so wrong? What makes this good person so wrong? What is this fundamental disagreement that we have in certain things? And as we go on to Jehovah's Witnesses, we'll be doing uh, Buddhism and Mormonism in, in, in the coming weeks. What makes this so wrong and what gives me a, such a, uh, an unction to want to tell you this? And I believe it's this, the theologians today call it this. There's a combination. There's a, there's a compromise. There's, there's a, a working together. And the theologians, they call it Chrislam. Chrislam, have you heard this term before? It's an effort to combine Christianity with Islam. Two of the great, powerful religions of the world, the West meets the East, and they come together. And they compromise as we are all worshiping the same God. And I believe it's so important to show this with you today because uh, children of God, saints of God, believers in God, uh, faith, faith family and friends, and all of you that may be new or visiting with us today, please hear this. You're going to hear lots of different things out there. And on paper, it sounds really good. 
And on TV, it may sound really good. There's evil in the world, absolutely. But there are people in the world that are evil, and they just don't know it. They're, they're completely bought into a lie, and they don't know it. Pope Francis, in the 2014 address last year, he was in Istanbul, Turkey. And he was with the Grand Imam of Islam there and with the President of Turkey. And he was in an Islamic mosque, and he was praying at the time of prayer. He, uh, the Imam and, and all the other Arabs and Muslims were, were bowed down and were worshiping in, in their normal prayer and they prayed toward Mecca. And, and the Pope was standing there in silent prayer, facing toward Mecca. He did not bow with them, he did not pray with them, but he was in there and was identifying with them. And then he made this statement when he left. It is essential that all citizens, Muslim and Christian, both in the provision and practice of the law, enjoy the same rights and respect the same duties. They will then find it easier to see each other as brothers and sisters who are traveling the same path, seeking always to reject misunderstandings while promoting cooperation and concord. When the Pope says this, and he's the leader of a billion people, and he is considered Jesus Christ on earth, the replacement of Christ on the earth, a billion people are bought into the fact that we're all heading to the same place. And we're all brothers and sisters. Completely rejecting, fundamentally rejecting the exclusivity of the claims of Christ. Giving the impression that we're all God's children. Because I'm telling you, we are not all God's children. Pope then further went on to say this. Allah and Jehovah are one and the same. We are traveling the same path. Allah and Jehovah are one and the same. This is why this kind of, of message, this kind of preaching is so important to, to us, for me, and for you, for us to get this. We've got to understand the difference in the true and the false and the right and the wrong. If we're going to hold this as the authoritative word of God and we believe this, we've got to believe in everything in it. Yeah. We can't combine it with anything else. We can't hold this up and then hold this up and, and try to compare the two and just pick out the best of them. And that's happening all over the place. In our churches today, a great effort is being made to repackage the gospel into a seeker-friendly presentation. Seeker-friendly presentation minus the human condition. We've all said that there's none righteous before God. A secret friendly presentation minus the condemnation that through one man's transgressions all are condemned. There is a curse of sin on this planet and on all of its inhabitants. And unless you come to Christ, unless you surrender your will and your heart and your mind and place your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you will be condemned and separated for all eternity. But praise God, we know the end of that chapter. Yes, through one man, one transgression entered into the curse of sin. But through one man through one man's righteousness comes life to all who will give their lives to him. Will you but consider for a moment the exclusivity of the claims of Christ that says it's only going to be this way. Our secret friendly presentation is minus the sacrificial blood atonement that is only through the cross that you come to salvation. There's the works-based salvation that, that Islam has, that Catholicism has, that Jehovah's Witness and Judaism has, all of them working for some measure of favor with God. And God says, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and come to the cross, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will give you hope. Your weakness will be made strong because of my strength and my grace. <laughs> Muslims are not lost. Because they're uncaring. Muslims are not lost because they're mean or they're nasty. Muslims are not lost because they're just wicked people. Muslims are not lost because of where they live and the plight that they have. Muslims are not lost because they have more or less money. Muslims are not lost because they're radical terrorists. They are lost because they don't know Jesus. Amen. They're lost because they don't follow Jesus. They've got the wrong book. Amen. That's why. They're lost. That's why they don't know Him. Christianity was never meant to be all-inclusive. It was never meant to be, all of you come, and I'm just going to give you rest. No, these are not the claims of Christ. He says, I'm the way. You've got to come through me. I'm the truth. You've got to know me. I'm the life. You have to die and be buried and risen in me. That's how you get to the Father. That's how you get eternal life. 
Christianity was never meant to be easy or nice. The call to the cross is hardly seeker friendly, isn't it? If anyone wishes to come after me, Jesus said he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You've got to be willing to hate your own father and mother and wife and children. Hate them in comparison to Christ. Christianity was never meant to be common to all men because you cannot consider becoming a Christian without realizing that Christianity excludes all other religions. Why? Because Christianity was never about a religion. What's it about, church? You tell me. It's a relationship with Jesus. Only a relationship with Jesus. You knowing Him and being known by Him. Sin is real. And its consequences are real. And I read this this week, and we'll conclude with this. Either Jesus bears your sin on the cross, or you will bear your sins in hell. Is that exclusive enough for you? Is that intolerant enough for you? I'm not here to kick Muslims today. I'm not here to poke Islam in the eye. I'm not here to do any of that. I'm here to call you Christians. Wake up and see. There's one Bible. There's one book. There is one God. But there's one Savior. And it will not happen through your obedience to a law. It will not happen through your obedience or the customs of a man that lived 2,000 years ago. It will happen when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Not all will come. Not all will come. On the bottom, of, on the back page of your notes today, you have some things there, I think, even book recommendation as to how to engage, how to talk, how to witness. I'm not going to go through that. I'm going to let you take that home and read that for yourself. But church, I desperately want you to hear this and get this. There's no such thing as Chrislam. There's no such thing as anything outside of that. These world religions are coming in with the gospel. They're coming in with, with their own brand of, of good news. They're coming in with their own measure of it. He'll do this, he'll do that. If their own covenant, so to speak. They're coming at you. And it's going to sound really good. And it's going to be really easy. And, and if you'll just try this, if you'll just do this, if you'll just taste of this, is it not the same thing that the devil did with Eve in the garden? If you'll just try this, if you'll just taste it, God, it it'll, it'll make you special. It'll make you wise. It'll save you. Did God say you're going to die? No. God, would you be enlightened? We're going to talk about that in Buddhism. The enlightenment that comes from inside of us, right? For another day. But it's time to go. So let me say this. There are some of you in here today that have never considered Islam. You've never considered any kind of Muslim faith. You've never considered anything else. You've been going to church for a long time. You've been a good Baptist. You've been a good Presbyterian. You've been a good Methodist. You've been a good Catholic. You've been a good Church of Christ. You've been all this stuff. You've been a good person. But I'm telling you, no matter where you come from, no matter what you do, look at what we're talking about today. No matter how good you've been, no matter how good you think you are, without Christ, you're lost. You're lost. The message today is not about puzzles, it's about you. And you knowing the truth. And allowing the truth to set you free. Worth thinking about, isn't it? Definitely worth preaching and sweating about. Bow your heads with me for the room. Lord, we've spent a good deal of time today examining a religion. We've spent a good deal of time examining a history of people. We've spent a great deal of time examining the differences between what we should be thinking and what we should be following as compared to the world's philosophies and the world's mindset. Lord, I'm asking if there would be any here today that would say, I'm not close to being a Muslim, but those things that they're practicing, the things that they do, the, the separateness that they have, that's been me too. I need to know more about this Jesus relationship, they might say. They may be in their heart examining right now in their spirit a desire to, to know more about this Jesus that we've sung about today, his love, his sacrifice. Father, I, I 
ask them, wherever there are questions, as you have answered them in Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would begin to prick their heart today, that they would respond to the good news that leads to salvation. Wherever they may be, whatever they've done, wherever they come from, Lord, would you change them? Transform them? 